All right, welcome. I'm Sheila Wildman, Associate Director of the Health Law Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my friend and colleague, Elaine Gibson. Uh, Elaine, of course, is on faculty here at Schulich, and many of you will know her from her long-standing uh, integral role in the seminar series, which she organized as Associate Director of the Health Law Institute from 1999 to 2013. Uh, Elaine has been a strong and constant force in health law and policy scholarship for many years and has made important contributions to an impressive range of areas uh, of inquiry and debate. Her early work examined the gendered effects of tort law remedies and indeed, as we'll see today, she's never left torts far behind, uh, although she has over her career addressed a broad array of subjects generally oriented to the end or public value of health. Much of her work in health law can be located in the tradition of feminist socio-legal studies, but otherwise her work is strikingly eclectic, uh, crisscrossing the domains of medical negligence, uh, reproductive health regulation, family law, mental health law, patient safety regimes, the list goes on. Uh, in the last decade and more, Elaine is engaged in intensive, award-winning work in privacy law, focusing on privacy and confidentiality of health information, with a particular emphasis on health research and public health surveillance. More recently, she's directed her scholarly as well as teaching energies to a range of topics in public health law. So last year, she was suddenly Nova Scotia's authority on driverless cars, or this is my understanding, or at least she was an uncommonly vocal and well-informed enthusiast <laughs> for the idea. Amidst all this variety, um, Elaine's work is always expressive of a will to bring scholarly rigor and public-mindedness uh, uh, together. She's completed a long list of reports for government and participated in government and government agency consultations on a range of policy initiatives and proposals from access to HIV medications, to protection of health information, to electronic monitoring of forensic patients most recently. Elaine has in this way informed a range of decisions made by government on matters of key importance provincially and nationally. Um, and it's not surprising that government keeps knocking on our door. Elaine's work is always deeply and comprehensively researched. It's careful, methodical, accessible, and fundamentally oriented to yielding a practical response to questions of how law and policy can be directed to improving quality of life, uh, and more generally, to strengthening the alignment of public values and public decision making. So. You're a hard act to follow, Elaine, and it seems now you have to follow yourself. So please join me in welcoming Elaine Gibson. Gosh, Sheila, thank you so much for that wonderful and um, overly impressive <laughs> um, billing of me. Uh, We'll see how the talk goes, <laughs> uh, but I'm humbled by your words. Thank you. So my topic for today is, is it time to adopt a no-fault scheme to compensate injured patients? I'm going to cut right to the chase and say uh, that my answer is a tentative maybe yes. Uh, but I'll uh, spend the next 40 minutes or so elaborating on that. So, what am I going to be covering? Um, first, I'm going to look at the incidence of adverse events in Canada, just what happens um, in the healthcare context uh, within Canada. Then I'll take you through the law's response to patient injury uh, and calls for reform. Uh, then I'll focus on no-fault compensation models. Uh, I will go into this in detail after, when we get to this point of the presentation, but let me just preface it by saying that 11 jurisdictions in the world have adopted some sort of no-fault compensation scheme, and the essence of it is that an administrative body um, replaces or partially replaces the role of, of um, medical malpractice law. Uh, we'll look at what they are and how they operate and the recent evidence of performance. We'll also talk about the complexities or confounders uh, in the idea of moving to no fault. Uh, 
Uh, and I'll talk about present day catalysts for change that give me the tentative maybe yes type of answer at the end. So here's a graphic image for you. Uh, it's a set of surgical scissors that were left inside of a patient following chest surgery. I want you to keep that image a little bit in mind as we look at the statistics. So Baker and Norton have done the most comprehensive study of um, patient adverse events, and they did it in 2004. They looked at a, a number of hospitals across Canada in the year 2000, and they estimated from the files that 70,000 adverse events were potentially preventable. Of those, they said that up to 23,750 deaths were preventable. Uh, these are, this is more deaths in the statistics than breast cancer, motor vehicle accidents, and HIV combined. Now, uh, don't freak out and try to read <laughs> the content of this. It's there for you to see the graphic, and I'm going to take you through uh, some of the different parts of the body that are focused on in this image. Uh, so Manitoba, unlike most provinces, requires reporting of adverse events. So this is a snapshot here, courtesy of the National Post, of adverse events in Manitoba hospitals from July 2012 to March 2013. So it's an eight-month period, and as you can see, it covers many parts of the body. On the next slide, I'm highlighting a number of them for you. So injury to the head, well, big injury to the head. Um, there was an equipment issue, and air was inadvertently pumped into the patient's carotid artery, causing death. Uh, in each case, by the way, I have the body part, the um, incident that went wrong, and the result. Um, in the chest, a feeding tube was fed into the lung by mistake, and the person developed aspiration pneumonia. Um, heart, a wrong prescription was given, causing cardiac arrest in the patient. Uh, kidney, they were doing a cesarean section, and the person's ureter was cut. This is a duct that runs from the kidney to the bladder, uh, and the person lost his kidney as a result. Lower abdomen, a stapler that was used in a relatively simple surgical procedure failed. They had to um, do the procedure differently and it led to the death of the patient. Um, foot, so a new surgical table uh, which lacked a proper brace for the person's leg that they were operating on and the patient's foot became permanently internally rotated as a result. So remember, this is an eight-month period in Little Manitoba that we're talking about. So what does the law do to respond to patient injury? Well, there are some minor avenues, well, potentially very significant, but seldom used, like criminal law. Um, but the main avenue of recourse for an injured patient is tort law, um, which is medical malpractice when we're talking about specifically about patient injury. So tort law is a faulty system in a number of respects, but some are specific to or highly exaggerated when it comes to medical malpractice in particular. The major aims of tort law are identified as twofold. First is to provide compensation to the injured person um, and second is to deter negative behavior. There are other aims often discussed, but these are kind of the fundamental core, generally, when you're talking about tort law. Now let's look at the performance of the system. In medical malpractice, there are very low success rates for patients. Um, there are substantive law doctrines that favor the health care provider. There are structural disincentives to suing. Uh, and there is a major role played by the Canadian Medical Protective Association, which represents 95% of doctors in Canada. So the low success rates. Unfortunately, we don't track 
civil law claims very um, thoroughly. The last good statistic we have on this comes from a review that was done by Robert Pritchard in 1990, uh, and he said that less than 10% of viable patient injury claims are compensated. That was his estimate. Now, if you look at the numbers, here are the figures for the year 2014 of civil actions that were resolved against physicians. Remember the 70,000 number for um, potentially preventable adverse events in Canada. So when we get to number of claims, at least claims resolved, we're at 1,092, so a dramatic drop. Now, not all of those potentially preventable injuries could have resulted in a successful tort claim, but it gives you an idea of how seldom um, cases are actually brought. What happens with those 1,092? Well, 587 are either dismissed or discontinued or abandoned. And what does this mean? This means that the patient gets no compensation at all in those circumstances in more than half of the suits that are actually brought. Uh, then 394 are settled and 111 went to judgment. What happened with those ones that went to judgment? The physician was successful in 85 and the plaintiff 26. So in the year 2014, in Canadian courts, plaintiffs were successful in 26 cases. Now you have to add on to that the number that settled um, so that you, you're a little bit higher, but this means that even in the cases that go to court, <coughs> the physician wins in 77% of those cases. And the statistics, by the way, are relatively consistent year to year in terms of the um, rates of success. Now let's look at the number of claims. So actions commenced against physicians. In the year 2000, 22.2 actions were commenced per 1,000 physicians. By 2014, it was 9.5 actions commenced per 1,000 physicians, so much less than half. In other words, patients are not suing much at all. So what's going on? I mentioned substantive law doctrines as part of the reason. So in, in a lawsuit in negligence, there are two elements that are primarily operative um, that the person suing needs to prove. And one is the standard of care and one is causation. Standard of care. So physicians get a remarkable nod from the judicial system in that if they are acting in accordance with standard medical practice, as long as it's a complex procedure, then they are immune um, from being found to have been negligent. This is unlike any other area of tort law, um, that this immunity is granted to, to physicians. There's mention in the case of other professionals, but there's also um, wording that suggests that it's particular to physicians. Um, there are also great difficulties in establishing causation. So causation can be uh, in many areas of tort law, a relatively straightforward um, cause and effect type of analysis. But imagine as soon as you're, you're talking about um, people who are undergoing medical procedures, they usually have um, morbidity aspects in the first instance, uh, and they have um, many complex um, matters that are affecting the results of um, what they're undergoing. And so causation is a, a, a veritable minefield in the area of medical malpractice. And it's the area that most cases fail on. There are structural disincentives built in as well. So first is, uh, because that standard of care um, that the patient has to establish that the uh, healthcare provider fell below, and also because of the need for causation, uh, 
there's a heavy, heavy reliance on expert evidence. And getting experts is costly. It becomes more costly, by the way, in a smaller province like Nova Scotia because the experts have to be brought in from elsewhere usually because it's hard to get experts who will testify against their um, friend and next door neighbor. Um, the need for expert evidence um, results in many um, patient lawyers, uh, I'll use the term plaintiff, I, uh, bear with me, so many plaintiff oriented lawyers in this area will not uh, even take a case unless it looks like the damages uh, will be uh, at least $300,000. So, and small claims court isn't available uh, in, for the smaller claims because of the need for experts. I mean, technically it would be available, but it uh, wouldn't uh, uh, be cost justified with, if you throw in the need for experts. Um, the legal costs that are awarded against the unsuccessful party um, serve as a disincentive uh, to bringing lawsuits. There are evidentiary protections that are provided in the area of health care that are um, unique to health care. The idea is that um, health care providers won't talk about what has gone wrong unless they have a protection from that information being shared for legal purposes. Um, the, another disincentive is the high mortality rate. So if you're talking about generally about patients that have suffered at least $300,000 worth of injury, um, then there's going to be a high likelihood of they, them dying um, before long. And damages are decreased if a person is deceased, even if the estate can continue the lawsuit. Um, so the role of the Canadian Medical Protective Association, and I'll be referring to it from time to time as CMPA for short. I had mentioned that they, they represent 95% of Canadian physicians. There's a fundamental difference between the CMPA and how um, most other areas operate, and that is that they are not an insurance company. They are explicitly a mutual defense organization. What does this mean? Well, insurance companies operate uh, to the bottom line. So if you have a car accident and one insurer versus the other and, um, uh, sorry, uh, or an insurer, an insurer and a, uh, a person who's been injured, they're going to each be driven to settle at some kind of approximate midpoint. Um, and uh, there's high incentive to settle. The CMPA sees its role as the defense of physicians and defending their reputations in particular. And so the incentive is far less to settle. Uh, and it's a model that is unique in the world. Um, so the CMPA has massive resources for defense. They have assets uh, in the last year of $3.2 billion. Um, they have a specialization of defense lawyers, and I see at least one of them in the audience. <laughs> Um, they have what was described by one Ontario judge, they can be known to have a scorched earth policy. In other words, stop at nothing if you have a case that um, is appropriate for valiant defense. There have been calls for reform of the medical malpractice system. I mentioned already a review in 1990 by Robert Pritchard. Justice Creever, who um, did the tainted blood inquiry, um, called for no-fault compensation, and he has since called more broadly for no-fault compensation. Uh, this is not unique to Canada. In the United Kingdom, Lord Wolfe was doing a review of their civil justice system generally, and he uh, made this statement. It became increasingly obvious that it was in the area of medical negligence that the civil justice system was failing most conspicuously to meet the needs of litigants. So if there have been all these calls for reform, there are um, forces that oppose reform as well. So one is inertia or complacency. 
Robert Pritchard, uh, eight years after he had released his report making a number of recommendations, gave a talk in which he addressed why zero of his recommendations had been taken up. And he said, well, he thought the main reason was that um, unlike in the United States, there's no perception of a medical malpractice crisis. And um, in the United States, there was a sense that the costs were getting way out of control and um, everything was going crazy. Not so much in Canada. Um, the Canadian Medical Protective Association is strong and it mounts a valiant defense of medical malpractice. Um, lawyers are a powerful lobby group and lawyers, frankly, stand to lose the most uh, if the no-fault compensation scheme is brought in. However, there have been a number of recent catalysts for change. First is the patient safety movement. Second is the financing of physician defense. And third is recent evidence of the performance of no-fault systems. And I'm going to go through each of these in turn eventually. I'm just plugging, I'm just giving you advance warning right now that these are the topics that um, give me reason to think that it might be time. Uh, and, but first I'm going to turn squarely to no fault and what it is. So there are 11 jurisdictions in 10 countries throughout the world that have adopted a no fault model. And basically, as I said, it's the creation of an administrative body so that instead of bringing a lawsuit, the injured person applies to whatever board it is um, and their claim is assessed. There are experts embedded in the system uh, that are meant to be uh, independent and impartial. Um, so the need for experts that I was mentioning is um, greatly reduced. Uh, there is no need, importantly, to establish that the healthcare provider was at fault. So the issues about standard of care and causation are greatly reduced. They're not eliminated, but they are certainly reduced. Um, so what do you have to establish to be successful? This is the Nordic model. So the five Scandinavian countries have a model that is uh, pretty close or exactly these criteria. So under this model, you need to establish one of the following. So if you have an equipment malfunction or a slip and fall, then it's just automatic. You have qualified for compensation. So a couple of the um, mentions that I gave of adverse events uh, involved equipment malfunction, the stapler uh, not working, those would automatically be subject to compensation. Or if you establish that the best practitioner in your field would have acted differently in the circumstance they faced. The best practitioner, not the average, not the reasonable, um, but the best person would have acted differently. Uh, if the injury could have been avoided with another equally effective treatment modality or method, um, or if the extent of the injury exceeds what a reasonable patient should endure. So this would take into account um, a serious adverse reaction that was just a function of the uh, medication or whatever. So, now the New Zealand model uh, has somewhat different criteria. You have to establish that the treatment caused the injury. Um, you have to establish that it was not the ordinary consequence of whatever treatment it was. Um, and that the adverse event was not solely attributable to resource allocation. In other words, uh, you know, delays due to, um, to time lapse between the scheduling of a, or the, the incidence and the scheduling of a procedure, for instance. So these models, um, they are very different in scope in different parts of the world. New Zealand is unique in the world in having a comprehensive no-fault scheme for accidental injury. So outside of any kind of patient injury, just any kind of injury that uh, is incurred uh, is covered by their scheme. Uh, then I uh, already tipped you off about the comprehensive patient injury schemes in 
Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Iceland. Uh, they consider our mode of operation to be pretty primitive, by the way, when they um, look at what happens in North America to do with uh, patient injury. Um, then there are some schemes that are limited to a particular type of injury, and in each case, um, it's a birth-related serious neurological injury. So the highest, um, highest types of awards in medical malpractice have to do with compromised babies. So babies who had a complication surrounding birth um, and uh, were profoundly injured. Uh, and if it's a neurological injury, then um, in Florida and Virginia and Japan, they have developed a no-fault compensation scheme. Uh, so they do it in part, you can tell, based on what I was saying about those being the most um, high levels of damages awards, they're hiving off um, the most serious ones um, to try to get a hold of that particular area uh, in terms of liability. And then there are a couple of schemes that are limited by the size of the claim. So Wales has a brand new um, program of no fault, which is specific to um, injuries um, for which one seeks compensation of up to 25,000 pounds. So they've hived off the lower end of the system, and France has done the opposite. It, it limits uh, its plan to uh, catastrophic injury. There are significant variations between the types of plans. The ones that I brought you through basically don't have any element of blame or fault in them, the Nordic and New Zealand models. The France model does. So you're back to certain of the questions that um, I said cause problems in the, in the area of medical malpractice. Um, there's an important question of whether the program is optional or mandatory. In other words, if a patient decides that they uh, are unsatisfied or don't want to use the administrative scheme, can they bring a lawsuit instead? Um, or can they bring a lawsuit if it's injury above a certain amount, for instance? Um, are they government operated or offered by private insurers? Um, uh, by the way, I think in the Canadian context, perhaps the scheme that is best known um, of a comparable type would be the workers' compensation scheme. Um, so if you think of how that operates, uh, to the extent to which you're aware how it operates, it's like that. Um, the awards can re uh, seek to replicate um, the tort damages awards, or they can be reduced or capped. So in Sweden, for instance, there's a cap of 1.2 million in damages in total. Now, the criteria for assessment as we go on to how the systems are performing. I had mentioned that compensation and deterrence are fundamental um, values to our um, medical malpractice system. I've identified values also of social justice and efficiency. I think these are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, they uh, justice, of course, is the overall aim of our justice system, um, but efficiency is also a necessary part of our justice system. Evidence of the performance of the no-fault schemes, then. Um, some, an, an actuarial study was done by PricewaterhouseCoopers in 2008, and it was comparing countries with fault-based and those with no-fault accident compensation generally. Uh, there was a very recent study done in 2014 as well that compares med medical malpractice systems in particular for the fault-based and the non-fault-based ones. And, and what they were looking at was the impact on healthcare spending overall in the OECD countries that they were looking at. So what did they find? the evidence of performance about cost. The actuaries said that the no-fault schemes um, had overall similar costs, fault versus no-fault, but that more people ended up being compensated with the no-fault scheme, and therefore the per-claimant cost was lower. Uh, the OECD study 
said that no fault decreases health expenditure per capita. Uh, there's a, an important caveat on that, and that is assuming that the scheme uncouples deterrence and compensation. In other words, what I was talking about, about removing the fault element of it. Uh, the administrative costs are significantly lower. That's because legal fees are greatly reduced or eliminated uh, in, in how some countries operate. Um, the cost of expert witnesses is greatly reduced and of course you're taking the cases away from the judicial system so the judicial system has some savings as well. How do they perform other than cost? Well, a significantly higher proportion of patients receive compensation and the compensation is received in a timely fashion. Very importantly, the healthcare provider becomes an ally of the patient instead of adverse, in an adversarial relationship to the patient. And that's because of the removal of the need to establish fault. And so in some of the jurisdictions, um, typically the physician will actually assist the patient in, um, in drafting their claim and in um, uh, putting the claim forward. Uh, transparency can be enhanced because there can be a greater spirit of openness to talk about what went wrong if there's no need for blame to be a part of it. Um, and claimants are found to have better health outcomes. They don't need the delay which can be up to five years before um, a case goes to trial during which time frankly there's a disincentive to get better because of the um, uh, need to establish your damages in court. So, there are some complexities or confounders that really need to be addressed. Uh, you know, so far I've made it sound pretty good, I think. <laughs> um, but some factors need to be taken into account. And one is that there will be startup costs for such a system. Um, Second is that comparisons are difficult due to variations in the social security net. So when we look at these other jurisdictions, we have to take into account, um, for instance, whether, uh, whether when you are injured, you automatically get some kind of employment insurance that runs for a year, unlike in Canada, um, or um, also whether um, you are paid um, when you have a baby and you're paid to be at home um, for a significant period of time. Um, another difference that I was interested in is that in the UK um, their legal aid was covering um, people bringing medical malpractice claims. So that would <laughs> result in a dramatically different situation in Canada I think if um, one could get legal aid, could qualify for legal aid to bring a medical malpractice lawsuit. Um, the division of powers is a complexity in Canada. What do I mean? Well, this system is basically provincially based, so we can't just say, oh, wouldn't a national system be nice? Let's get it, bring in a national system. Um, it would need to be done province by province. That's not to say the provinces couldn't agree on this uh, and agree on a, an approach. Whoops. Um, Next complexity or confounder is that the government controls the compensation amounts. So I was making a comparison to workers' comp. You know that the amount that someone gets under a workers' comp claim is capped at a certain level. Um, similarly, um, under these plans, I had mentioned they may or may not try to replicate the types of damages one can get through the tort system. Certainly a complaint about the New Zealand scheme is that patients get far less um, than they would if they were entitled to sue in tort. Um, and uh, importantly also on that control of compensation amounts is the fact that if economic times get tough, it's a, the government can save money by reducing the um, amount of award. Um, Issues that need to be addressed in addition to what I have talked about already. Um, if the no-fault scheme is optional, some of the benefit gets lost. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, um, to the extent to which 
for instance, lawyers may not be a necessary part of the process in bringing a no-fault claim. If you're going to have the, um, the option of suing in court, then obviously you're not going to have as much of reduced costs and the um, judicial system will still be involved and all of that. Uh, interestingly, in Sweden, where it is optional, uh, they report that 99% of the cases go through the, the no-fault compensation scheme. In other words, there's very low claiming behavior. On the other hand, um, part of this might have to do with whether a culture is litigious or not. Um, hospital liability. So a great many of our resources are, are spent right now in trying to sort out liability as between physicians and hospitals. Why is this? Hospitals are not per se responsible for the actions of physicians who have visiting privileges at the hospital. They're responsible for um, uh, appropriate selection um, and awarding of privileges and uh, to some extent training and supervision, but beyond that they are not automatically liable. And so, as I said, a great deal of resources get spent sorting it out as between the two. If a no-fault scheme were brought in to compensate injured patients, it would make sense that both hospital and um, both hospital and healthcare provider all be under the same scheme. Um, one can anticipate strong resistance from the legal profession for reasons that I identified. Okay, so I had mentioned the catalyst for change, and first is the evidence of performance of the no-fault systems, which I've just taken you through. Second, the patient safety movement. So in the last 12 years, there's been a significant focus on patient safety. And, you know, I just, last week, um, Capital Health had a conference on patient safety and there are posters all through the hospital and everything. Um, there was, as a result of concerns, the creation of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. There's been, just in the last couple of weeks, uh, well, last few weeks, um, a new list, which is an I the identification of never events, like um, surgery on the wrong limb. Uh, it's a list of the top never events that never should be happening in healthcare facilities. Um, both the Canadian Patient Safety Institute and the Health Council of Canada have called for an examination of no-fault compensation. Now, the other is the funding of physician defense. So there was a dramatic increase in CMPA fees year over year, 2014-15 to 2015-16. Um, you can see the numbers there. We go from 7.6 million to 15 million. Uh, and that was an increase of 98.1% year over year. Um, that percentage increase, in my understanding, is the same for all jurisdictions outside of Ontario and Quebec. Um, so, governments right now are highly motivated. Why are governments motivated? Well, if there's one takeaway from this talk <laughs> that you remember, I want you to understand the role of government in the funding of CMPA fees. Uh, until this year, the Nova Scotia government contributed 90% of physician CMPA fees above $1,500. That's presently under negotiation, and actually they just resumed negotiations today. Um, some, in some provinces, 100% of the fees are paid by the province, or in some, it's 100% above $1,000. In every province, they are um, um, somehow the government contributes to those fees. In Ontario, the government contribution is now $198.5 million that government is paying in CMPA fees. There are reasons for this that have um, developed historically, but the main point that you should reflect on is that our tax dollars then are used to defeat the claims of injured patients because our governments are sponsoring, uh, are subsidizing the fees. Uh, so, you can see that there's strong incentive right now on the part of provinces. And there have been some developments uh, in terms of the, that dramatic increase that I 
mentioned, um, and there are some adjustments upcoming for um, the, the fee structures. Um, so the criteria for assessment that I had mentioned, um, I had included compensation, deterrence, social justice, and efficiency. So how are they performing on these fronts? How are the no-fault systems performing? So in the area of compensation, I think it's a, it's a uh, no-brainer, no really. Um, that the compensation is superior. Many, many more patients get compensated. They may not get compensated at as high of levels, um, but they get compensated and they get compensated quickly. The area of deterrence. So we haven't talked much about that. I mentioned what deterrence is, uh, that it is um, uh, curbing negative behavior. The Medical malpractice system is weak on deterrence in the first instance. Why is it weak on deterrence? Because it's not actually the um, person who has done the, who has created the adverse event uh, who pays for it. It's all paid out of the CMPA fees. Um, and the CMPA, by the way, um, pays those fees. A lot of different insurance plans have caps at one million or two million. CMPA, um, it can go to whatever size of award it is. Um, so some deterrence can be lost. Um, the deterrence, as I said, is already weak in the medical malpractice system, the operation of deterrence. On the other hand, that very need, the, the very thing that I was saying is really good about no fault, the, that you don't need to establish fault or blame, um, means that deterrence is reduced, uh, and so it uh, doesn't rate as well on that front. Uh, and that um, means that you really need uh, a system that includes uh, a robust, just seeing if it's, <laughs> you, you need a system that includes robust error reporting uh, and discipline. So those are essential parts of going to no fault, is that you need, as I say, robust um, system of reporting of error, and also um, you need to ensure that the disciplinary system is effective enough. Um, in terms of social justice, certainly uh, the statistics that I showed you about um, number of patients who end up being compensated following medical error being so low, um, this system is superior in enhancing um, the, certainly the number of patients and the types of patients who receive compensation. Uh, when it comes to efficiency, definitely superior. The costs of the system's functioning drop from about 50% down to, in some jurisdictions, more like 12.5% because of the replacement of the whole um, medical malpractice system with an administrative system. And that concludes my presentation. You know, I agree completely with you. So 
Deterrents, there are commonly identified to be a couple of types of deterrents. And one is specific deterrence, um, i.e., hopefully that individual will not um, act in the same way next time around. Um, and then there's general deterrence, and that is the effects of, a, for instance, a judgment as against an individual um, that is known more broadly and has effect on how others are going to operate in a similar circumstance. Uh, and the um, financial aspects of deterrence, so it depends on your view in terms of whether it hits your pocketbook. And um, in neither case does it really hit your pocketbook. Um, but the, um, the effects of a fault-based judgment against someone or of settling and the, um, uh, the attribution of fault that implicitly accompanies that is somewhat there. Uh, if there's a settlement as compared to if there's a no-fault um, compensation award. Yeah. Maybe you could speak a little more about what you think the proper scope of the system is, because you directed it to claims against physicians, but I'm thinking there could be people injured by other actors in the healthcare system, you know, nurses, lab technicians, orderlies, hospital administrators, up to including the Minister of Health, ambulance drivers, paramedics, firefighters administering first aid, midwives, doulas. There are lots of people, and, and not so many suits against them as physicians, but if you take the physicians outside the suits and somebody's injured by a nurse and get full court recovery, then there'll be a big rise in suits against nurses. So, so who's, who's going to get the excuse from court law under your system? It, it, it's just the healthcare system is pretty, pretty big. I think, uh, it's wider. It, it, it seems to me that what's driving this is the rise of cost of the CMTA thing. That may be a good trigger, but it might not be the best criteria for defining the edge of the system by simply saying, let's have the system operate in areas where there would otherwise be physicians and their claims compensated by the CMTA. It's just not, it's not a rational way for figuring what's in and what's out of the system. Yeah, it's a good question and I don't have a full answer to it, but it reminds me to say that a lot of what I was mentioning uh, has to do with physicians specifically. Why is that? It's because we have the best evidence in that area. And so um, a, a lot of it uh, is physician-based, um, and there were times when I slipped into the language of healthcare provider, uh, purposely so. Um, and in terms of, I mentioned the hospital liability aspect of it and um, it being important that hospital um, should be taken into account, which leads us to more um, complexities if that's the case. Um, but I don't know for sure. Um, certainly the schemes in Scandinavia revolve around patient injury. Um, but they're not exclusively hospital-based. And so it would be if you are, and they have separate actually, uh, this gets into a level of detail that I didn't get into, but they have um, separate schemes as well for prescription drug injury. Um, so that um, kind of takes care of that aspect of it. But I would think, Vaughn, that I would really want it to be relatively broad and not just hospital-based. Um, but the complexities of which you mentioned, like emergency response teams, for instance, yeah. hope so. <laughs> yeah, Dan. I'm the one who got to show that earlier. Did I understand you about to say that you expect that the no fault system will reduce the cost? The administrative costs, yes. Yes. Because if you take your hypothesis that the, the soaring costs of litigation to compensate a few hundred people uh, will be replaced by the cost to compensate 70,000 people. Surely it's obvious that the cost will soar. Yeah, and so... Pre previous consideration that we don't usually flounder 
founder of the Actually, utopian, but impossible. Right. So let me go back to the So the um, the study done by Price Waterhouse Coopers um, in comparing fault and no fault accident compensation generally, so not specific to medical malpractice, um, they found that the no fault schemes overall costs were similar, but that more people got compensated with no fault. Oh, but it's not medical specific. It includes med it's not medical specific. It includes medical. Um, the OECD study was looking at health expenditures per capita, so taking into account the compensation, um, but more generally, um, cost to the healthcare system of injury. And in that, they uh, said that it decreases health expenditure per capita. Uh, so, and then the, the uh, main thing I was saying about costs is, uh, is that the administrative costs are significantly lower. Right now, it's about 50% that goes um, to administrative costs. Gets lowered to, in the range, potentially of 15%. Um, yeah, Diane and I, and then I have Fiona. Um, so are we talking about funding out of general tax revenues? If that's so, that's significantly different from workers' comp. Mm. Yes, yeah. I was just using workers' comp yeah, as no, an I, example I, I of the, an administrative scheme. I mean, I'm yeah. trying to think, is there yeah. any comparable funding source compared to workers' comp? And I can't think of one yeah. other than Yeah. And the answer actually is in different countries, it, it operates in different ways. So in some, it actually would come out of the um, district health authorities uh, budget, the compensation. Um, but still of uh, yeah, so yeah. So, so it depends. Official, yeah. General it's general tax revenues, except that it's, it, it depends on the country's sense of whether it's appropriate that everyone pays for it or those who engage in a particular activity um, pay for it. So that's the distinction about having it come out of a health care budget. Yes. So if we eventually go to a two-tiered system where you've got social health care and then you have the fee for service, can this be applied to both equally, or would there have to be differences for those? If I want to get a knee replacement out of QE2, the province pays for it, I want to go down to a private shop, I pay for it. And then if you have an injury and I want it, would it be applied the same, where the social system is paying for the one cost for the other one? Right. So um, what happens in different jurisdictions on that is that um, the insurance can be made mandatory. In other words, it's the healthcare provider that needs to actually have the insurance. Um, I had mentioned, I think, in one of the slides that um, it can be government operated, the administrative scheme, or it can be operated by private insurers. And so in the private insurer case, you just have the system be mandatory or optional to purchase it. But um, when I mentioned the, the ones that are for serious neurological injury of infants. Um, on those ones, uh, certainly in Japan, it's not mandatory to participate in that system at all, but uh, a very, very high percentage of obstetricians participate in it um, and purchase the insurance. Yeah. But the, the first one, I, one of the things I find compelling about um, your analysis and about the proposal uh, generally is the shift from sort of corrective justice focus, at least idealized, so the idea that the individual will be in some sense you know, fully compensated for the harm, to social justice um, focus, which you, you mentioned and you gave us some detail about in terms of saying more people would be compensated. But is there, um, you know, I have my intuitions about this, but is there any sort of data looking at the socioeconomic or other characteristics of those who tend to receive tort law compensation, uh, just to make clearer the, uh, just what kind of distributive justice uh, types of questions we're looking at in terms of you know, distributing compensation among different groups. That was one, one question that I, that I had. Um, and then I did have a, a, another one, 
um, which uh, goes to, you mentioned that France had a system of no fault that um, does in some way express blame uh, and you contrasted that with you know the Nordic and New Zealand models and I wasn't sure, I just wondered sort of how how that works. Is it a specific penalty or in what way is blame uh, expressed in that model? That's a couple questions. Right. Um, so second one first maybe. Um, in the French system, the patient still has to establish the circumstances for causation of the injury um, being due to someone uh, messing up in what they did. Uh, and so that's where the fault element comes back in because unless they can establish that, then they don't receive compensation. Um, the social justice um, aspect, it's, a, it's an excellent question that you're asking and um, boy, there's not empirical studies to my knowledge other than um, when I talked about the $300,000 minimum to bring a, a medical malpractice action, um, the patient needs to be in a circumstance where they can, um, can at least put forward some uh, of the costs, the initial costs. So you have a whole lot of costs that are um, layered on right away in terms of uh, obtaining expert witnesses and all of that. And um, it's uh, so people who can't afford it uh, can't afford it. Yeah, I just wondered to what extent contingency, or some, you know, say cases with yeah. babies being severely harmed or what have you, whether there, it would be such an obvious win that there'd be some way into the system, but perhaps that's just not the case. Such an obvious win. Uh, such an obvious win because so, such an obvious error for oh, instance, I see. and, a, and oh. a potential for a very high award, so you would think that it might be done on a contingency basis, although there's still going to be costs. Yep, yeah, yeah. so there, so there are, it, it's um, pretty exclusively done on contingency basis, actually, sure. yeah. But, um, but <laughs> you saw the numbers. There are very, very few cases that are brought, even including the ones that settle. Um, and uh, so it means that uh, we certainly have major class issues about this because if you are uh, um, impoverished, then you're certainly not going to bring a, an action in tort. Yes? Uh, under the no-fault scheme, do you, after it's established that there'll be compensation to a patient, is there anything uh, does anything happen to the doctor after that? Like, do, does anyone investigate? Like, do the College of Surgeons investigate their conduct and stuff like that, and whether their rights are, will be sufficiently protected under this kind of scheme? Is there, what, what is the, the dynamic there between the compensation and then further investigation? Right. So, the um, so there is a disciplinary process, as you know, through the College of Physicians and Surgeons, and that's. In fact, um, many, many more cases now that the CMPA is, re is um, representing, I think the, the comparable figure is more than 4,000 that are um, regulatory affairs, discipline, um, or uh, it can be, um, for instance, uh, a question of fraud in billing um, or any of that, and that's, um, and so CMPA represents them in, in those kinds of cases as well. Um, the, so are you asking it, what's the parallel? So a, a complaint uh, needs to be laid with the College of Physicians and Surgeons or... Well, maybe I can help here. Yeah. The, uh, the colleges uh, now have a renewal form every year for a medical license. And on that form there are questions about have you settled any lawsuits this year or have you been sued this year? When there is a lawsuit, uh, the college becomes aware. Yeah. And they ask for information in appropriate cases yeah. for follow up. Yeah, and they if can they, commence a, a, a disciplinary action on the on their own. Right? They, they, they can, but remember, uh, not every medical error is, is a disciplinable consequence. Right. Yeah. I, I guess sorry. I guess my question was more so like under a no fault scheme, would there be further investigation into the doctor's conduct? after 
Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you were asking about no fault. Um, and that's where I was saying because you do have the somewhat loss of deterrence, you need to ensure that you have um, the, the properly functioned disciplinary system uh, and also a, a system for reporting of error. Uh, so I was mentioning early on when I showed you that figure of the human body uh, that Manitoba has adverse events reporting that's mandatory, but not every jurisdiction in Canada has that. Standard, so there apparently uh, so there was a, a set of criteria that one could uh, hitch the claim for compensation on, and one of them applied the standard of the best practitioner, yeah. right? So it was a sort of fault on the best practitioner. I thought, wow, how would that? Because immediately, you know, what comes to mind is house or something like that. And how's, you know, like how, how do people actually make those claims? And have to be looking around for, you know, who is it? Who's the top gun? And, you know, I don't know. How does that work in practice? Best practitioner. How does it work? Is it so, much more abstract? So, so really how it works is that there, there's a team of um, the administrative team, right? And there are physicians who serve on the administrative team um, who then uh, assess it. And if in their judgment, the best practitioner, which may be themselves, <laughs> or um, uh, maybe someone else, if that best practitioner in that particular specialty, um, if they would have done it differently, then you, your claim is established. So it's a standard sort of like the reasonable person, but higher, as opposed to bringing in evidence as to, you know, Joe so and so does this and. Yeah. Kind of, okay. Yeah, that's right, yeah. May I butt in again? Sure. What point is it? Because our, our system is fault based and fault based on a reasonable standard. Yeah. So I understood you to say that we're moving from the reasonable standard to the very best standard. If you could establish, that was one, you had to establish one of the different criteria, so I'll take you back to them. Yeah, I wasn't equating it to the reasonable standard, just a, just a so, generalized standard. So yes, if, if you could establish that the best, best practitioner in that particular specialty would have acted differently, then you've established a claim. But look at the other ones as well. If the injury could have been avoided with another equally effective treatment modality, or if the extent of injury exceeds what the reasonable person should endure. You can see that, w so when I was talking about the best standard, that's where the best standard comes in as opposed to the reasonable person standard. Dan, can you talk a little bit more? I think you mentioned Sweden as different compensations for pharmaceutical drug. Um, injuries, and I, I, I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of progressive licensing and the discussion around releasing of drugs even before phase three trials, you know, sort of really early stages under the sort of care of physicians in certain conditions and stuff like this. And I'm, I'm just thinking that just the whole potential for, for um, um, problems to, that, that might evolve from this. So how does Sweden do you deal with that? Like deal with pharmaceutical drug injuries differently? So it's a similar no-fault scheme that it, I, I don't know the details of it. I haven't been looking at that, Janice, but it, it's similarly a compensation scheme based on no-fault due to pharmaceutical injury. Um, Fiona may... Is no? no. so many possibilities, right? There's off-license prescribing, and there's yeah. license prescribing, but uh, with increasingly drugs coming through at earlier stages of development. I can't imagine that they would accept that because, as you point out, the, the risks would be so much greater than you allow those classes of drugs that haven't really been totally approved and, you know, all the adverse effects sort of like. Yeah, it'd be interesting to look at them. Oh, okay. I'm just going to look up the specific criterion. <laughs> 
it is that you, it's for patients who experience a medical hazard directly attributable to an act of prevention, diagnosis, or treatment. Um, it, it, so it, it may not count as no fault technically in a way, except that it's a, an establishment of an administrative scheme that um, can replace use of the court system. It counts as no fault because it's it's so it's not causation as a fault thing in France. It's that it resulted from treatment, but not that the treatment was negligent. So that's where the fault disappears. Yeah, except you you have to like these are all um, as a result of treatment. Right. So that's why that still counts as no fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, I it's a good question. Like really. It's, it's a hybrid system, uh, the French system. Uh, and so I would have to think more about whether it, it, it technically should be in the no fault category. The label no fault is a little bit misleading in that regard as well. Okay, well, uh, there are no other questions. <laughs> Going once. Going twice. Thank you so much. And let me just say uh, just a quick word about our next uh, seminar, which is coming up next term. So we have four more health law seminars uh, coming up next term. And the first is on January 15th. So Friday, January 15th, we have Amy Bombay, who's with the Department of Psychiatry and the School of Nursing here at Dow. And her uh, topic is historical trauma among Aboriginal peoples implications for improving well-being. So again, that's Amy Bombay on Friday, uh, the 15th of January. Um, so I think you, you, see, you see what I mean. I loved how all of your ears really pricked up when Elaine came to her um, takeaway, right, when she said tax dollars are being used to defeat the claims of injured patients. I just felt the whole work room sort of woke up and, and I thought, yeah, so I'm talking about, you know, deeply researched, important, um, but also accessible uh, work is uh, what I associate with Elaine uh, Gibson. So thanks, Elaine, for taking us through this challenging area of regulatory uh, reform proposals and sharing your tentative but still uh, compelling insights with us. Thanks.